our attention spans are less than that of a goldfish. Does it seem like our lives are moving along at an ever faster pace? Our average attention span has decreased from 12 seconds down to 8 seconds. It's dropped by about 4 seconds since 2000. I have a short attention span. I go through life day by day with the craving to always be receiving more. More activities to do, more people to talk to, more stimulation. It's not very often nowadays that I sit fully through anything in one sitting, and if I do, I'm most likely doing something else on the side during it. Sometimes I'll catch myself losing focus and scrolling on my phone, or I'll watch television while I talk to someone. Sometimes I'll get so bad to the point where I'll be talking, watching, scrolling, and say playing a game all in unison. That can't be healthy. Luckily, as I said, it's not very often I sit through anything all the way, especially with no distractions. But there are exceptions when I can and do. There are many sources of media out there that I can't look away from no matter how hard I try. Films, literature, products that are so good they hook me in with no way out. But I'm not just talking good. I mean pieces of art that are so inherently interesting, so unfathomable in design that they trump and surpass everything else I've ever witnessed. There's a difference between just great work and work that is great but also changes your life, gives you meaning, teaches you the importance of a topic. I can still lose interest in something that is just great, but when I'm stricken to my core, there's no escape, no chance a phone could get me to peer off. For instance, one of my favorite games of all time is Sea of Thieves. I think everything about it is perfection. Everything I want out of a game. I have hundreds, maybe thousands of hours, but I can't always pick it up and sit down for countless time and play in one sitting. I have to split up sessions. You would think if I love it so much and if I talk about how perfect it is, I would have no problem playing it for however long, however many days, months, or years in a row. Yet, I'm satisfied after only an hour or two, when I then lose interest and log off. Then I'll go calendar pages not touching it again, and for no other reason besides the fact that I'm burnt out or just bored of it for the time being. Some games do that to me, even if they are a part of my favorites. But there are games that exceed that aforementioned perfection. There's no meaning to Sea of Thieves, just mindless enjoyment. But when a game breaks that barrier, has an actual impact, and connects with your emotions on a different level, not only does it hold my attention and could continue to forever, but it affects me far more than any other form of media could. It's more interactive. Once in Flower Lake is a title that does just that. You awake in a small cabin placed in the middle of nowhere. Harsh winter weather surrounds you. You are given a task by an unnamed voice playing through the computer in your room to go out and crank four massive pieces of heavy machinery to produce energy for what is said to be, quote, a greater purpose. It's a monotonous task, one that you will have to repeat multiple times daily for what seems like eternity as you are not promised an end date. You begin working nevertheless though. The trudge through the banks of snow is a difficult one, a tiring feat, but one you must endure. Just as work is for us all, the greater purpose is to provide for our loved ones, make sure we always have enough to make ends meet, gain praise from the higher ups in the company that we are hired to. The slow walk is the imagery of the misery we feel along the way, in the pace of which we feel things are moving, how time drags on. The repetition also lasts for our eternity as well, as many of us are never going to stop working until our bodies break down and we can't live anymore. Matter of fact, if we stopped working, everything around us would crumble, leaving us trapped in our loops as the character is. You need money, so you need your career. You can't just quit. A few shifts go by, cranking as you were told, and you start to question if what you're doing is really helping at all, if you're really making a difference. You can't see anything happening in front of you, so doubt is only natural. This can be interpreted as the lack of appreciation from faculty, bosses. The fact is, you are always replaceable, and you probably mean nothing to the people above you, so that doubting is a fair thing to do. Is what you're doing where you work actually helping the company, making anyone's lives easier? Can you really call yourself a good worker if no one even acknowledges your work? 
This questioning leads you to start branching out, exploring a bit off of your designated path. You realize the area around you is caged off all the way. Outside the cage, you see two individuals talking about a missing person they were sent here to find. Moments after, they are then shot and killed by patrol robots that are meant to be making sure there are no escapees from the said cages. Seeing this gruesome happening, you make it your mission to find whoever they were searching for. A winter storm hits, a blizzard of exponential power. You find a broken robot buried in the snow, pick it up and realize the wall around you drops whenever you bring the robot to it. Outside the barrier, you find the person and carry her back to your cabin. When she wakes up, you and her have a conversation about how you've been feeling, and she agrees that there's more out there, that this isn't all for you. So you then make it your life goal to abandon cranking machines and go to find answers to escape out of wherever you are. Before you go, you have one of two options though, wind them up one more time or forget about them and move on. In this case, I chose to visit them one more time. Upon reaching the end of the game, you find a massive hole that you go down into. What you find down there though is unbelievable. All this time, you really were making a difference. The machines were to power pods with other humans inside of them. However, you still broke routine, and as you meet the orb that has been talking to you from your computer all along, it states to you that this results in your termination. Right as your life is about to be ended, the woman barges in, takes out the being, and saves you. The final message displays. Sometimes, special people come into our lives. They change the way we are used to things, pull us out of our routines, and make us believe that life can be better. And thanks to these people, we are who we are. Yes, the reality of life is a dark one, but there are beacons that can come along and change it all around, so that the heartache is masked along the way. So maybe the reality isn't even that dark at all. And maybe you'll be okay either way no matter what you do. The character in Once in Flower Lake was doing a good thing by keeping at his task and saving all the humans in the capsules, but he was also doing a good thing by escaping and changing the narrative so that nobody has to be put into his position he was in ever again. Living is the same way. We all have this anxiety, all this torment, doubt, instead of the realistic mindset of the fact that things will be okay, no matter what. No matter what you're going through, no matter if you're as low as you've ever been. The lower you are, the more room that gives you to go up. You are not finished, and life is worth living, and being happy to live at that. It's all perspective. If you dwell on the problems that lie in front of you, you will start feeding into the negativity they bring, further pushing yourself into the rut you are in. It's about overcoming those obstacles that seem like they are impossible too. Superliminal delves deeper into that topic and it teaches you about it through the form of levels that require you to think outside the box to complete. If you held an object close to your face right now, it would seem big in your eyes, but if you held it further away, it would seem smaller, although still remaining the same size. In this game, however, it tinkers with that concept by actually making the object bigger or smaller depending on how it looks in your vision. Not only that, but there are also things like paintings on the walls that if looked at from certain angles will form a real object to assist you and so much more. It's honestly interesting enough to play through in one sitting just because of the mechanics of it alone, but how it wraps up is really what stands out to me. Your life will always be a struggle and you will always have problems, but today you had the chance to see things differently. Even though it meant facing obstacles that seemed impossible at first, you thought outside the box and you overcame them. Because you saw things from every angle, you understood them for what they really were, because you kept moving forward no matter how far off the path you were told you were headed or how unexpected it became, you found your way. In a few minutes, you'll be back in the real world, and some part of you will say that none of this was real. So how could it have meant anything? But just like the power of perspective itself, it will have been as real as you believed it to be. All you've got to do is wake up. These types of games are a necessity in an ever-failing, ever-deteriorating world. It's important to always be striving to be better, the best version of you. Whether that's through acts of kindness, battling and winning against your own mental illness, you can do it. You can and you should always keep the brighter perspective on every scenario. 
There are no benefits to being down in the dumps. Not only does it damage you, but it projects to everyone else around you. You don't have to be that main character in Once in Flower Lake. You can be the beacon instead, the woman he found. You can be the light of this world. No matter if you speak out and help people in a small radius around you or globally, you can make a change. You can save people. But it all starts with saving yourself. Superliminal isn't the only game that can be attention holding on its own without a touching story. Take Viewfinder for example. A fantastic title sort of similar as it also plays off of perspective. In this one though, you take photos that are laying around and hold them in front of you to bring everything in them into a three-dimensional plane. It's a puzzle game too, but it gives you so much more freedom when it comes to how you solve each puzzle and complete each level. Screenbound is another innovative one that isn't released yet but has outstanding potential. It's actually a bit on the nose topic-wise as well, as the goal in it is to play a 2D game in your hand in the 3D game you are standing in at the same time, with both of them interacting with each other. Sometimes you may have to jump on something in the 2D section to make an event occur in the 3D, and vice versa. The reason it's so ironic though, is because it's basically a game that makes you multitask with two different forms of media, similar to what most of us do with our phones and televisions, like I said before. I don't think what makes these games draw you in and hook you is just their concepts alone. I think it's more because of how they execute them. A lot goes into keeping someone's attention, no matter what kind of content you're making, a game or a video. And of course, we've already been over how conveying emotion is one of the best ways too. And we've been over depression, anxiety, demotivation. But I believe there's something far more frequent in every game in the area I'm speaking on. A reoccurring trait. They all give off a sense of confusion, some more than less, so no matter if they have a story or not, they still have the same effect on anyone who picks them up, as the others do. Confusion is powerful, because it spawns questions. Questions that can only be answered at the end of a level, or when the credits roll. So normally, they start you off in a scenario where everything is happening, but nothing is cohesive, nothing is explained. Or they start you off with a puzzle, that you aren't aware of how to solve yet. And they build that cohesion piece by piece throughout your playthrough until you have the answer you were looking for, the solution to the story, or the levels. Most of the time, it doesn't even stop there. It could be possible that even through an ending, more questions appear. Then you play again, and again. But the thing is, most of these games have infinite interpretations. You aren't meant to know what everything means. There often is no definite answer to anything. That's how I felt when I opened up What Remains of Edith Finch for the first time. You're a kid on a ferry, with a journal in your hand. You open it up, and immediately the writer confirms your confusion by saying, a lot of this isn't going to make sense to you, and I'm sorry about that. And then it throws you right in. I'll try my best to shortly explain. Basically, there's this family house everyone in the Finch family has lived in all the way back since the early 1900s. But it sort of has a negative aura around it. See, everyone in the family has died a tragic death in or near this place, young age, old age, so many different ways. This onslaught of death has terrorized the family so long that they all believed that it was a curse. Through this game, you explore this house from the eyes of the mother of the child reading the journal, as the journal was written to him before her unfortunate passing. The twist is, not only has the mother, Edith Finch, not returned to this abode in almost a decade, she has also never been into any of the other family members' rooms, even when she did live there. The doors had been locked for nearly a century out of fear of the said curse, but today was different. Today, she had a key from her late mother. She was finally going to witness the untouched wonders of her ancestry, and how they all lost their lives. Now you may be wondering why the word wonders is being used to describe, well, death. That's because the deaths in this game are, in a way, wonderful. You, you step into each space and a visual presentation unfolds upon you, and it's all so beautiful. There's two ways you can view death, as this horrid, dark, twisted demise we all have to endure, or from a standpoint of acceptance, appreciation, peace. Death is a thing we all fear, but what remains of Edith Finch tackles that fact and makes you feel like you don't have to, rather you shouldn't. The Finch family had some disappearances, home invasions, neglectful events, accidents, abuse, miscarriages that all took place and all led to them dying, but you aren't shown the nasty parts of those events for long. 
Edith has an imagination that always goes to a lighter route in the end to make it seem like they were all happy when they went. For instance, Barbara Finch was a child star, a beloved one, and as she grew up, she fell less and less out of the limelight. She was known for her role in horror movies mainly, where she would always let out her iconic scream. Not only could she not do that scream anymore when she got older, but she also just didn't look the same, didn't perform the same, and that took a toll on her. One night, the Finch house was broken into by a group of, quote, monsters, which is an exaggerated explanation. They are actually meant to be just crazed old fans. They were depicted this way because of what they were planning to do and as a reference back to her old horror movies. But what they did was kidnapped and took her out. As she was in the midst of that, she let out a scream with a smile on her face, and it was the best scream anyone had heard out of her since her fame. Edith extends onto that by inferring that this was probably the happiest she's been since then too. She finally got her attention back, the attention nobody is given, the attention she's been longing for. She got to feel like a star one more time, surrounded by supporters. Now this game has a great message, a very helpful message, as loss is something that happens on a day-to-day -day basis. But with that message, alongside the visuals, it just doesn't get better than this game. In fact, this isn't even a game. This is art, in its rawest form. And as for if there was ever a curse or not, that's more for you to decide. The Finch family couldn't even decide themselves. They were skeptics. That's where the confusion comes into play. It started with confusion until the story reached the end, and even then it threw more at you to question. The Stanley Parable is another one I just can't wrap my head around, and it's rated right there in popularity next to what remains of Edith Finch. With its over 40 different endings, all with their own infinite amounts of conclusions to draw that nobody can interpret, but everyone has tried to. It's just far too much to even begin with, but it's a must play. The developer and writer behind it has a name very prominent in the industry, Davy Reedon, and it's because of this game. But even though it is so popular and has had conversation after another surrounding it, even though it is the thing that put him on the map, I don't think it's the work I like the most from him. No. That actually comes in a less known narrative adventure released two years after. Hi there. Thank you very much for playing the beginner's guide. We're going to look at the games made by a friend of mine named Coda. I met Coda in early 2009 at a time when I was really struggling with some personal stuff, and his work pointed me in a very powerful direction. <laughs> The Beginner's Guide is the deepest game yet, but I can't talk about it. Nobody can. I think I've already said too much, or too little. It's not about any of that, or it's about all, or, or more. I. It's a game about exactly what I'm trying to do right now, and why you shouldn't. The main character, Davey, has a friend, or used to have a friend, named Coda. Coda is a game developer that only ever made games for himself, never posting a single one online. But Davey got a hold of them. He's the only other person too. Coda at the time of the Beginner's Guide's release stopped making games in general, and in an attempt to get him to go back to creating again, Davey chose to release this title to the world, chock full of all of his short experiences. He thought that if enough people played, enough reception was received that Coda would somehow see it and regain his spark. Either way, this was his only way of contacting him. They broke off their friendship years before, but we'll get there. As you take your venture, Davey continuously narrates that all these games must be connected, that there must be a deeper meaning. Even in something as simple as a level for CSGO that Coda made, he was still trying to draw meaning. But what I like is that even though he starts from the simple aesthetic of a desert town, he then scatters these colorful abstract blobs and impossible floating crates around the level. And of course, it destroys the illusion that this actually is a desert town, and instead this level becomes a kind of calling card from its creator. It's like a reminder that this video game was constructed by a real person. And it kind of makes you wonder, what was going through his head as he was building this? And I'm not saying that all of them didn't have meaning. They were definitely meant to be a safe haven. A lot of them had ideas scattered everywhere or had a storyline based off of whatever Coda was going through mentally. 
But not all of them were like that, and even in the ones that were, they just went over basic human emotions that we all have. Nothing deeper than that. He was just going through some things and making these projects worse coping mechanisms. A way to gather all of his thoughts. Davy insisted though, that there was more. The issue was bigger than it was, that he was losing his friend, watching him break right in front of him. He thought that through these games, he was getting to know who Coda really was. He was learning about the entirety of this person through his work, but he couldn't have been more wrong. The work in his mind kept getting darker and darker. And when one of the games tackled the topic of demotivation and burnout, he decided it was time for him to step in. He thought that maybe if he gave the games to some close friends and if they liked them, then that would spawn some reaction out of Coda to want to keep making them, to keep doing what he loved. So he did, and they all loved the games. What a relief. This was a step in the right direction. He helped his friend. Now to relay the information back to Coda about how much everyone enjoyed what he made. I'm the reason that you stopped making games, aren't I? It's because of what I did. I poisoned it for you. I don't think I ever told you this, but when I took your work and I was showing it to people, it actually felt... <laughs> it felt as though I were responsible for something important and valuable. And the people who played them, they treated me like I was important. They really listened and cared about what I had to say. Even though I was showing your work, it was... I felt good about myself. Finally. For a moment, while I had that, I liked myself. And then you stopped. And I didn't have anything left to show people. I, I just had to be with myself. And as soon as that happened, there was no feeling at all. Nothing less than nothing. What does that mean? That's why I'm releasing this collection of your work, is because I haven't been able to find any other way to reach you. I've tried everything. And so a part of me has hope that if I put this compilation out into the world, and if I put my name on it, that maybe enough people will play it so that it'll find its way to you, so that I can tell you that I'm sorry. I know I screwed up. If I apologize to you truly and deeply, will you start making games again? Please, I need to feel okay with myself again. And I always felt okay as long as I had your work to see myself in. I mean, is, is something wrong with me? Because I know that I did an awful thing, and I'm doing it again right now. Like, I'm, I'm showing people your work, but I can't stop myself from doing it. That's how badly I need to feel something again, like I'm an addict. There has to be something wrong with me. Can I apologize? What if I tell you I was wrong? Will that work? Will that fix it? I, I, I don't know. I don't think it will, but there's nothing else that I can do. Just tell me what you want. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please, start making games again. Please help me. Please give me some of whatever it is that, that makes you complete. I want whatever that wholeness is that you just summoned out of nothing and you put into your work. You were complete in some way that I never was. I want to know how to how to, I want to know how to be a good person. I want to know how not to hate myself. Please. I'm fading and all I want is to know that I'm going to be okay. Davy was the broken one all along. And in attempts to save himself, he projected his faults onto the person he cared so deeply about, who he looked up to, whom he was jealous of. The meaning he found from Coda's games were not just the meaning they inherently had. He found deeper meaning because he was searching for it, trying to draw relations to his troubles, his traumas, his own mental fortitude unfolding. And that led to Coda quitting altogether, which is exactly why nobody should do the same towards the beginner's guide either. Respect the work, but don't make it yours. I'll admit, once in Flower Lake didn't actually have as much meaning as I gave it. I just overinterpreted everything to make it relate to me more. A lot of art has no meaning to it, but us humans, we strive to find something. Something to make us feel better, to make us feel like we better understand the artist more. But more often than not, we're wrong, 
unless we live inside someone else's body, we cannot speak for them. This reigns true for any aspect of living, friendships, relationships. There's so much judgment, so much fixing. A lot of the time where there's nothing to be fixed at all. I can't tell you how many times I've gone out of my way to try to change people into what I think they should be because I believe it wouldn't help them when they're really just perfect the way they are. They just aren't perfect for me. When it comes down to it, does it all really matter at all? Why do we focus so much on others and lose track of ourselves? It's good to be good to people, but know your boundaries. You can't speak on everything. It's not your place. We live in a big wide world with so many things going on, so many opinions and takes being given, so much fixing trying to be done. But you can't. You can't make the world how you want it to be. You can contribute to the bettering of it, but you will never fix it. You can, however, fix your world, how you live your life. Work will always be necessary, as money is needed for everything. You can't get rid of work, but you can choose to do what you love, follow your dreams. Even then, you'll still have your struggles, you'll still have your problems, but it's how you perceive those struggles that keeps you going. Even through the toughest of events, something as difficult as death itself, through smaller things like friendships, self-loathing, jealousy, you have all the power. But what do I know? I can't speak on you. What you do is up to you. So, what will you do?